our responsive obedience to the teaching of the Word of God, our submission to the leadership of pastors and elders, it's not because they are perfectly wise or right all the time. It's because God is perfectly worthy of our worship. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we continue our series through the book of Hebrews called So Great a Salvation. Uh, Jonathan, I love the fact that uh, you're saying, you know, part of our worship is to be obedient, to, to follow what Scripture says and to live in obedience to that. Well, that is at the very heart of the Christian life, being responsive to the teaching of the Word of God that we receive. And as that works out in practice, it does mean, and Hebrews is helping us to see this, and it's why chapter 13 is such an important chapter. Hebrews is helping us to see that we need to be responsive to the teaching as we receive it from those in leadership in our local church. Uh, how we respond to the leaders God sets over us in a biblical church, godly leaders who are rightly set apart for pastoring and, and for eldership within our church, it does reflect something of our heart of response to the Lord himself. Hmm. And, and often we would want to disassociate those things and say, well, I, I obey the Bible, but I'll, I'll take Christian leaders, you know, um, the ones we like, and I, you know, I might just ignore those I, I find a little bit more difficult or whatever. But within the context of the local church, God does call us through his word to take seriously the leaders he has given us. And that is a part of godliness, and it's a part of our growth in discipleship. We're going to continue to look at that today from the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 13 as we continue our message, True Worship. Here is Jonathan. We may be rejected by those around us for sticking with the faith we received from our leaders of old, the gospel we first heard. But the writer says, we are the privileged ones. And where the writer takes us now, I think is just beautiful, he wants to show us now that the place of exclusion, the place of social exclusion, the place of the outcast is actually the place of privilege. Just notice where he takes us, verse 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. When sacrifices are offered at the temple, the bodies of the animals that are given for sin are then taken outside the community and burned. And when Jesus gave himself to be our sacrifice, he was crucified outside the city gate on a hill called Calvary. Verse 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. You see, Jesus became an exile, an outcast, one rejected by contemporary society. And it may be that in sticking with the faith of old, the faith we receive from those leaders who have gone to heaven before us, the faith that may be very unpopular today, the faith that society rejects, the faith that even the mainstream Christian world might question when the newest fad comes along, it may be that we become outcasts by doing that. But here's what the cross teaches us. The cross teaches us that the place of exclusion is actually the place of privilege, of access, of honor. Verse 13, therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. There's going to be constant pressure for us to buy into the latest spiritual fad. There will be constant pressure on us actually to abandon the faith altogether. And one of the key ways that we're going to keep our head and remain steady in the days to come and the months to come and the years to come, one of the key ways we're going to do that by the grace of God, one of the key ways we'll become equipped to accept and even embrace being outcasts and eccentrics it is to remember faithful leaders who have gone before us, who have held faithfully to the word of God and who finished their Christian life well. As I reflect on all this, I do think that we need to be willing to embrace social exclusion. I think we need to be willing to be unpopular, not only among secularists who can't comprehend our belief in God, 
but also among the mainstream of popular religion. We need to hold doggedly to the faith that we once received, and we need to give attention to models of faith and godliness who have gone before us. I sometimes think actually that we should lose a little bit of our appetite for reading the newest book to come off the evangelical press, and we should spend just a little bit more time reading some old books. <laughs> Some books produced by godly saints who finished their earthly race well and who have been proved faithful over time. In thinking over these verses, I was reminded of a book by an evangelical hero of the 19th century, J.C. Ryle. And in his book entitled Old Paths, he is dealing with the very same issues that were coming up in his day. New theological trends and patterns and fads that were calling into question the essentials of evangelical faith. Just listen to this from his introduction. This book, he writes, contains nothing but the old paths in which the apostolic Christians, the reformers, the best English churchmen for the last 300 years, and the best evangelical Christians of the present day have persistently walked. From these paths, I see no reason to depart. They are often sneered at and ridiculed as old-fashioned, worn out, and powerless in the 19th century. Be it so, none of these things move me. I have yet to learn that there is any system of religious teaching, by whatever name it may be called, which produces one quarter of the effect on human nature that is produced by the old, despised system of doctrine, which is commonly called evangelical. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. I wonder who are those formative leaders in your own life? Those whose lives you need to emulate, whose faith you need to imitate. Remember your leaders, says the writer next. Obey your leaders, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give account. The dynamics of the relationship with our, our leaders is summarized here in verse 17 in perhaps the most clear and succinct way in all the Bible. As part of the church, we obey leaders the writer tells us. We, we, we don't obey in a blind and unthinking way, but as pastors, as elders, teach the word of God and apply the scriptures to our life together, as we elders try our best to do that before God, then the church family, all of us together, we should respond willingly, even with obedience and submission, to use the language here of the passage. Now, I don't know how you react in reading verse 17. I find, personally speaking, that I trip over this just a little. I, I find myself hesitating before repeating the language of obedience and submission. When it comes to our response to leaders, we, we don't normally warm to that kind of idea. We live in an age, after all, that doesn't really like the, the idea of authority all that much. I think trust in leaders and leadership is at a, at a low ebb in almost every realm, government, business, charity, many more areas of life besides. So why would we do this? How can we make sense of this in a world where we are encouraged to be rugged individualists, to stand for our own rights and to pursue our own personal dreams and our own personal agenda? Well, to try and make sense of this, let me just step back for a moment and, and remind us of the context here. Remember the header of this whole section, the God of Zion above will subject the whole earth to a great shaking, a destructive act of judgment. He has given us a place in the city above through Jesus, our Savior. And then chapter 12, verse 28, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Why would we respond to human leaders in such a countercultural way within the church? 
knowing that the best earthly leaders, pastors and elders within the church, are flawed and are sinful and get things wrong. Why would we do this? We do it quite simply because we worship the Lord above. We do it because God our Savior has given us a hope beyond this world that is headed for destruction. We, we do this because we're a people who worship him. And this is the pattern of life. This is the pattern of worship that he has set out for us. You see, if we were to take the view that we will only respond willingly and well to pastors and elders who are right all the time and who lead perfectly, but then we, when we're not convinced, we'll sort of hold their feet to the fire and make life a little bit challenging for them. If that's our approach, we haven't quite seen the big picture it's important for us to see how, that how we relate to one another within the Christian family is all about our worship to God and our attitude to God and our response to God. It's all of it an expression of worship. Let brotherly love continue, verse 1, not because your brothers and sisters are lovable all the time, but because God is worshipable all the time. Our response of obedience to the teaching of the word of God, our submission to the leadership of pastors and elders, it's not because they are perfectly wise or right all the time. And certainly not because pastors like me are sinless and never make a mess of things. No, it's because God is perfectly worthy of our worship. And we relate to one another out of worship to him. Now, the responsiveness, the submissiveness, the obedience of the church family to the leadership of the elders, that's only one side of the dynamic here. But the other side uh, is that leaders bear a huge responsibility, and you'll have noticed that in the verse, but both to the whole congregation and to God himself. Notice how the verse continues there in verse 17. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. That's a very, very sobering prospect for any church leader. The idea of standing before the Lord at the end of it all and giving an account for our leadership and our care. I know that household dynamics during this time under lockdown are uh, under quite a lot of strain in many quarters. I read just recently that a number of parents with teenagers in our community have reached such a point of exasperation that actually they've been calling upon the police to help them just marshal the situation and manage the situation. <laughs> All parents of teenagers will know that there can be times of challenge, no matter how delightful your teenagers may be. Sometimes leadership within the home involves just a little bit of groaning. Well, it can be that way within the church. Anyone who has experience of church leadership knows that it can be like that in some seasons. But the call here for all of us as we collectively follow the leadership of our elders it is to allow the eldership to carry out the care of souls with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to anyone concerned. But we need to hear the call, don't we? And we need to hear the encouragement. I take it that it's here in the Word of God for a very, very good reason. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called True Worship, part of our series, So Great a Salvation. And we'll get back to Hebrews 13 in just a moment, so hope you'll stay with us. You know, if you're enjoying Jonathan's teaching on the radio, have you checked it out online? You can come to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and you'll be able to listen to Jonathan's teaching there. One other way that you can connect with Jonathan's teaching is our YouTube channel. I hope you'll check out Encounter the Truth on YouTube and then like and subscribe. That way you'll be up to date anytime we post new information there. That's a great way to not only listen to, but watch Jonathan teach. Again, on YouTube, you're simply looking for Encounter the Truth or our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here's Jonathan. Remember your leaders. Submit to your leaders. And finally, the writer says to each one of us, pray for your leaders. 
Now, the writer of this letter is quite evidently a leader within this congregation. It seems that he's gone away for a time and he sent this written message back to the church, likely to be read out as a sermon, is my best guess, uh, at the weekly gathering. But as he sends this encouragement to the church family, as one of their leaders, he asks now for prayer. Verse 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Pray for us leaders. That's the plea. That's the encouragement. And as I read that, I, I do resonate with that request myself as a church leader. We who are involved in church leadership, let me tell you, we need your prayers. We aren't superhuman. We are not sinlessly perfect, not by any means. We are feeble. We are fallen. We are frail, just like everyone else in the church family. But by the grace of God, we do have special responsibilities before God. Responsibilities that verse 17 has reminded us of. And I have to say, personally speaking, it is so wonderfully encouraging to hear from members of the church family that you pray for us pastors and elders. Many people tell me how they're praying for us. A, a number in the church family I know are praying for me daily. They tell me that and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I, I'd actually just love to take the opportunity to say a huge thank you for that because it means so much to me. It's a sign, I believe, of a healthy, worshiping church that the leadership are upheld in prayer. And it's a sign of God's grace among us. Knowing that leadership brings pressure, knowing that there is sober responsibility attached to leadership, knowing that the health of the leadership of the church impacts the health of the whole church in a material way. Hebrews has given us a very big, a very practical, and a very challenging picture of Christian worship here in chapter 13, and I'm sure you feel that as I do. And actually, when we look at this picture of Christian worship in all its detail here, brotherly love, hospitality, care for the persecuted, honoring marriage, loving people rather than money, honoring leaders, when we look at the whole sweep of this picture of worship, I think we could feel quite overwhelmed. I wonder if you share that sense. How can we actually live in this way consistently? How can we really bring the great God of heaven, the practical worship that is his due? How can we do that? We must look at all these exhortations and feel something of our, our failure to live in this way, something of our weakness. And I, I think the writer is a good pastor is quite aware of all that. He's aware of our frailty and our weakness. And I think that's why he finishes as he does with that wonderful prayer. Notice it with me. Verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. How are we going to live in this way? How can we worship God as a people who remember the faith of our leaders and live in their example? How can we live submissively to the very flawed leaders that God has given us? How can we leaders lead with integrity and faithfulness? How can we persevere in faithful prayer for our leaders? How can we be this people, this worshiping people that God has called us to be? Well, we can only do it as the God of peace equips us. But here's the thing. We know he can equip us. We know his power. He's the God who brought Jesus, our shepherd, back from the dead. And notice what the writer says. He brought Jesus from the dead by the blood of the eternal covenant. That's a really interesting statement, I think, don't you? What does Jesus' shed blood on the cross have to do with his resurrection by the Father's hand? What is the link here? Well, I think it is this. 
Jesus shed his blood to pay the price of our sin, of our guilt, of our wrongdoing. He, he, he shed his blood to cleanse us, to establish a covenant, a binding commitment of salvation with us so that our wrongdoing would be forgiven. Our defilement before God will be cleansed. He made that great offering at the cross. And God the Father then responded to that offering. He's the judge after all. What's he going to make of this sacrifice? Is he going to accept it? And we know the outcome. The resurrection of Jesus was God the Father's declaration that the sacrifice of Jesus was acceptable. The work of Jesus in paying for our sin, it was effective. And so that shed blood became the basis for the resurrection. It became even the reason for the resurrection. And so God raised Jesus by virtue of the blood that was shed. And the writer in a very compressed way, in a rich way, is saying this to us. The God who raised Jesus, the God who accepted Jesus' blood for our sin, who had the power to give him a victory over the grave, this God has the power to equip you, a cleansed people, a forgiven people, with everything needed to do his will. Verse 21. And we need the everything that he can give us, don't we? We need the inclination to do his will. Because on our own and in our fallen selves, we don't even feel like obeying half the time. And we need the energy. We need the spiritual strength because we're too weary to obey on our own. And we need the perseverance because we give up so easily. And we need the endurance. We need to see this thing through to the end. And only, only he can achieve that. By his spirit who lives within us and works within us if we belong to him. The God who raised Jesus from the dead will equip us to do his will. To do what's pleasing in his sight. To worship him as we ought to worship him with our whole lives, with everything that we are and everything that we do. And he does it not so that we can feel self-satisfied. No, he does it in order that Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, who died for his sheep, our high priest who was raised and is on high even now. He, he, he does it that our Lord Jesus, our shepherd, might be glorified forever and ever. And so friends, as we close, may this God of peace equip you today and equip me today with everything we need to worship him acceptably, with reverence and with awe for the glory of our Savior this day and in all the days to come. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, taking a look at true worship and leadership in the church, helping us to remember our leaders, obey our leaders, and to pray for our leaders. If you've missed any part of this broadcast, you can go back and listen. Just come to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. You know, Encounter the Truth is a listener supported. It is your generosity that keeps Jonathan's teaching on the station each day. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called The Case for Christ. It is written by Lee Strobel. And Jonathan, it seems like this book really resonates with the uh, heartbeat of the ministry of Encounter the Truth. Well, we have such a heart to reach people with the good news of Jesus who haven't yet heard it, who maybe haven't engaged with the truth of the Christian gospel and of the Word of God, people who are curious, people who are exploring. And this is just a tremendous resource for such a person. And, and if that's you, we would love to get this book into your hands as our gift to you. This is one of the most effective resources in setting out the case that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, that he is who he says he is. Uh, this book has been read by millions and millions of people over recent years, and it's been such a help to so many. We would love to be able to give it to you, that it might help you as you explore the claims of Christ. Well, it is our thank you. As you support Encounter the Truth with a gift of any amount this month, you can find out more, give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. 
That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths and our producer, Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.